The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, the dark side of the moon sues for deformation of character. Get it? Deformation. Ha <laughs> ha. Destiny and freedom brawl in fencing contests, not to the death, but to the pain. Plus, we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of David Drake's The Sea Without a Shore. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain Editor Tony Daniel. And I'm Editorial Assistant Christopher Rocchio. This time we have part two of our two-part interview with Larry Correa and John Ringo as they discuss their new book, Monster Hunter Memoirs Grunge, a new sub-series entry in Larry Correa's Monster Hunter universe. And it's a very fun book from those powerhouses, Correa and Ringo. And of course, we continue with our complete audiobook serialization of The Sea Without a Shore by David Drake. That's all coming up. Now, here's the news. Mass market, mass market, you are a fat haul, especially here in the Ides of August. The Bain August mass market paperbacks are at booksellers, and they include, hey, A Call to Arms by David Weber and Timothy Zahn, with Thomas Pope in there for Bunine Special Ops. Travis Long continues his career in the Royal Manticoran Navy 300 years before Honor Harrington's day, and, hint, hint, just before the wormhole passage that turns the backwater Manticore system into a major trading hub is discovered. Also out is 1636, The Cardinal Virtues, by Eric Flint and Walter H. Hunt. It has been 20 years since King Louis took Anna Maria Mauricia as his wife, and their union has not yet produced an heir. Chief Minister Cardinal Richelieu has a plan, but the appearance of the modern town of Grantville, West Virginia, in German lands has altered the politics of Europe and the metaphysics of time. Can Grantville natives and Richelieu save the air and save France? Sacre bleu! We are about to find out. And at Booksellers is Soldiers Out of Time by Steve White. This is book five in Steve White's Jason Thanu time travel series. And here Jason has a final confrontation with the transhumanist menace he has fought across time. Jason has powerful enemies, but with the help from a couple of British sergeants and a would-be bugler from India... Gunga something, I can't remember his name exactly. Anyway, go on. He may have just the team to meet the challenge. A Call to Arms by David Weber and Timothy Zahn, 1636 The Cardinal Virtues by Eric Flint and Walter Hunt, and Soldiers Out of Time by Steve White are now available in mass market paperback at booksellers everywhere. Now here is part two of our two-part interview with Larry Correa and John Ringo. They discuss Monster Hunter memoirs, Grunge. Part one of this interview can be found on last week's podcast. I want to welcome Larry Correa and John Ringo to the podcast. Hello, guys. Hey, Larry Correa is the creator of the New York Times bestselling Monster Hunter International series, including Monster Hunter International and uh, Monster Hunter Vendetta, Monster Hunter Alpha, Monster Hunter Nemesis, and Monster Hunter Legion, as well as the creator of the Magic Noir themed Grim Noir Chronicles, which uh, you may remember we uh, serialized Hard Magic, the first in that series here on the podcast. He's the co-author with Mike Coopery of the Dead Six books in the uh, Dead Six Military adventure series, including the latest entry, Alliance of Shadows, which is coming up in October. It's a really great book I've been working on here. He is also the author of Son of the Black Sword, book one in the Forgotten Warrior Saga, as well as lots of other books and stories. Larry has been an accountant, part owner of a gun store, a shooting instructor, and a competitive shooter himself. He grew up in the California outback on a farm and now lives in Utah. And we have John Ringo. John is the New York Times bestselling creator of the Pauline War series, including groundbreaking first novel in the series, A Hymn Before Battle. Um, great book. The Council War series, the Empire Man series, co-authored with David Weber, the ghost, I guess you'd call it a techno-thriller series or something like that. 
the uh, the Troy Rising series, uh, the Queen of Wands Contemporary Fantasy series, um, and the Black Tide Rising Science Based Zombie series. Um, we have just finished up serializing uh, Under a Graveyard Sky here on the podcast as well, and many other series and standalones. He's co-authored with David Weber, Michael Z. Williamson, Tom Crapman, Travis S. Taylor, Ryan Sear, Julie Cochran, and, and now Larry Correa. John was in the U.S. Army, rose to the rank of specialist as a member of the 82nd Airborne Division. He served four years active duty and two years of reserve with Florida National Guard. And he picked up the Combat Infantryman Badge, Parachute is Badge, Army Commendation Medal, Good Conduct Medal, Armed Forces Expeditionary Medal for Granada, and the National Defense Service Medal. At the moment, we are all gathered to talk about a new collaboration now at Booksellers Everywhere between Larry Correa and John Ringo. It's set in Larry's Monster Hunter universe and is called Monster Hunter Memoirs Grunge. This is the first of three books in the Monster Hunter Memoirs subseries by Larry and John, and it is packed with loads of excitement and really some wicked fun. One of the greatest experts on swords in modern history is Hank Reinhardt, yeah. passed away several years ago. Yeah. Um, Hank and I had a discussion about katanas because I had gotten into a debate in having to do with my book Princess of Wands about whether katanas were different or not. And Hank said, oh, God, yes. Katanas are a completely different breed of sword. Now, they're not, there's no such thing as the perfect sword. That was one thing that Hank was very, very plain on. There's no such thing as a perfect sword for every situation. Katanas, for example, would have been lousy against the heavily armored knights of the Middle Ages because they weren't real good for going through iron and steel. But for cutting off limbs with relatively light armor, they were superb. And the reason was that they literally would be forged and reforged with the best swords over a year, day in, day out, repeatedly folded over and over and over again. The folding process created a situation where you could you could get edges which were at the nanometer level instead of the micrometer level. Most swords are uh, the the edge is actually in micrometers, but you could actually get down to nanometers with a uh, with a good katana. So they really will go through an arm so fast that the person doesn't realize they've lost their arm. Whereas you hit it with a standard longsword or you hit it with a standard uh, falchion or something like that, they're going to feel it. A katana you don't even feel. Uh, so there is a real difference with the true ancient multi-folded three-sole, four-sole, five-sole five blades. And you simply, in the 1980s, you simply could not get a four- or five-sole blade. It's very difficult now because the Japanese bought them all up. Anyway. And um, the the three-sole, the, he, they, I mean, we, without a spoiler, we could say that, for instance, he um, he tested out by, um, on a, for a barbecue <laughs> preparation. In a in a beautiful ceremony, but um, and the, before he joins MHI, um, I, when I was doing Queen of Wands, I had a debate. It actually had to do with Wakasashi's or uh, Wakazari's um, with the guy that was doing a lot of my uh, uh, hand to hand combat uh, advising on Princess of Wands, and he was primarily a Brazilian jiu jitsu guy. And his argument was that a heavy blade was better for cutting through stuff. And that was when I was talking with Hank. And Hank uh, said, no, it's a katana. If, if you want to, if you want severance, a katana is the way to go. Um, so I actually had a scene in the book where the, the martial arts guy that, that is a heavy blade guy versus Chad with his three soul blade. Um, they're, they're going to have a big pig roast, and both of them essentially slaughter the pigs by taking the heads off. And it's, it's a scene that actually was done at one of the uh, 
one of the wars. It wasn't Pensick. It might have been Gulf Wars, where someone who was an expert in katanas showed that a katana will go through in a way that nothing else will. Yeah, well, it's a it's a pretty cool scene, uh, as are some of the kills. So, uh, what about the um, what about the guns? Um, there's a, Chad has an Uzi that um, he complains uh, that that they. What is it? It jams on 45s, but he fixes it and he modifies it to shoot silver. Can you all correct me where I'm wrong with that? Or <laughs> right when I when I went in and looked at what the gun what guns were going to be available in the 1980s, and I actually went on Facebook and I said, okay, what were the big guns in the 1980s? And people were posting all sorts of stuff and having big debates about it and everything. Um, but one of the things was there was a, an, an Uzi carbine that was in 45. And I looked at it and went, you know, you can modify that. And I went, and that was one place where I call research the R word. Um, but I researched that fairly extensively and, and found things like the bolt had a tendency to mangle 45 ammunition, but there was a way to fix that. Um, I didn't get into the fact that the magazines, I didn't get into detail on the magazines, but the magazines had to be modified as well. Um, but uh, Chad basically creates a weapon that doesn't exist. Um, and the reason for that was that I knew that he was going to need 45, and he knew that he was going to need 45. And the only person in the world who can actually do well with a Thompson submachine gun is Earl Harbinger. Um, no, I don't know. I just stay with him. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, but Chad is smaller than I am. Small guys don't generally do well with stuff like that. Hell, you could probably I even do a. Uh, you could probably even fi fire a Barrett sitting. No, I, I, again, I've, done, I've, done the second I've done it freehand. I've done it sitting. I've done it prone. Uh, got a lot of rounds through an M82, actually. Um, they're not too bad. That's why I did like the scene in the second one where he tries to shoot it off a car roof sitting or sitting on the car hood. That was yeah. funny as hell. Yeah, that was because <laughs> as, as a gun guy, as a gun guy, I saw where that was going, and I'm glad you put that in because I was like, ah. Oh, and I, the only thing I added to that scene was that it was freshly waxed. <laughs> and so, uh, I see. Or well, we're talking about Newtonian physics the here, Barrett. right? Yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, spoiler uh, alert there. <laughs> yeah, because a Barrett is going to push you back four to six inches, no matter what the hell you do. I mean, you can fire it offhand. You can fire it standing. Um just about anyone can oh. fire a Barrett standing, but you got to lean way yeah, into part, it. The hard part actually is not the recoil. When you're when you fire it freehand, it's that you know it's thirty something pounds, and most of that weight is out over the muzzle, so it's really really front heavy. So it's really really hard to aim. I mean, it takes quite a bit of upper body strength to actually hit anything. Uh, so I've got yeah. a uh, I've got a SEAL buddy who was an instructor at at Buds out out on the West Coast, and he talked about firing the Barrett offhand, and uh, the team got into a competition as to who could fire the most rounds offhand. And it ended up being one of the sniper instructors. Um, actually, I think it was when he was still in the teams. It was the team sniper ended up putting 109 rounds through an 82 offhand uh, without setting it down. Um, yeah, that, that and, a lot of weight. <laughs> yeah, that dude lifts a lot of weights because if you've ever picked up a Barrett, it's 35 pounds and, and almost all of the weight is forward. So you're basically holding that 35 pounds up with your left arm. Um, and it just, it just brutalizes you. Yeah, I was shooting I've only ever, ever been able to get time. two or three rounds off off it. So yeah, I was taking shooting milk jugs at 100 one time. I would have, I mean, you had a like a 14 power scope on it too. So what I would do is I would actually aim above the target, and then as, as the muzzle would drop, I would just kind of yank the trigger as it was dropping through the milk jug. Was the best way to aim, you know? Because yeah. after after a couple shots, your arm is just your your left arm is just quivering. Yeah, yeah, you're toast. But Chad's Chad's not a big dude, and so there's a scene in the second one where he he's sitting. On not the most stable surface. Um, He's sitting on the hood of a car. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, it rocks him back off balance over the edge. And the sad thing is, is Milo's driving the car, and he's a very considerate driver. <laughs> so I'll just leave it at that. All right. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. So, the, 
the first book is a great introduction to the character, and it's a fun book. It's it's a it's a good it's a good clean read. It's got a very gut wrenching ending. I will say that. Um, but it's a it's a good clean read. It's a bunch of pro tips, and 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 then you get to this really gut wrenching ending. The second book he gets dropped into absolute hell, and the second book is just over the top. They just it, it's constant just madness. Um, just one you know just that scene where he's he's firing a Barrett and he's on a suburban street firing a Barrett offhand or firing a Barrett seated on the hood of a car, you know, on a Thursday night in a suburban street because that's how out of control where he is is. Um, but uh, yeah. Well, Seattle. Um, Next question. Seattle gets pretty out of control. The main part of the story uh, is about Chad's time hunting monsters in Seattle. Um, I lived in Seattle for five years in the early nineties. You got a lot of great stuff right, by the way. Um, I lived on Vashon there, um, and I was there during the day. And I was sitting about ten feet away when a certain lady you depict as a very annoying elven princess read a very annoying and self-serving tribute to uh, this dead guitar playing dude. That she was married to. Anyway, why does Chad pick Seattle? Um, I personally like Seattle as a city. I've been there several times. Um, it's not. I've never lived there. I don't know it as know it like the back of my hand. But it was someplace that I knew that I could play stuff, and there would be a certain amount of realistic local color to it. And again, Seattle in the 1980s. Seattle in the 1980s was not covered up with coffee shops. Um, Seattle in the 1980s was different from now. Oh, yeah. Well, it was the um, the recovery from the Boeing slump was going on. It was a down-and-out sort of place. It, it, it had certain things then which are which carry over to now, things like the, the university district was still there. Uh, there was a large Asian community, and Chad interacts a lot with the Asian community. Um, but it, it, was a, it was a different city than it is now. Um, for better or ill. Uh, so that's why I placed it in Seattle. The other thing was that Chad has a characteristic that I also have, which is that he hates heat. Um, so the reason that the character picked it in the book was that he wanted to go someplace cold. He was actually given the opportunity to be on the top team in the company, and he's like, God, I really hate the heat. I want to get out of the southeast. <laughs> <laughs> Can I go to Seattle instead? Yeah, because when they're not stationed in Alabama, they spend a lot of their time in South America. Yeah. In Mexico and places like that. That's kind of out of the frying yeah, and, pan into the fire kind of stuff. Yeah, and, and Chad just wanted to get get away from heat. Yeah. Of course, in the sequel, he gets redeployed to New Orleans. And it's the one place where, as he, put, as he puts it, I found my inner bitch. Because <laughs> he just complains about the heat in the yeah. book constantly. It's even hotter than... than <laughs> Northeast Alabama, but the um, uh, the other thing about Seattle is that it's it, because everybody's so sallow, um, and uh, and and it's a good place for vampires, right, to sort of blend in. Yeah, there's there's actually a discussion about that in the book that if you see somebody who's really incredibly pale in Phoenix, um, it's either somebody who's really into the goth movement or a vampire. And in either case, you stake them. Uh, <laughs> uh, but in Seattle, somebody that's really pale is just like a long-term resident. Uh, <laughs> I had a friend now, if they're really Seattle pale with a new... Used to, Sorry, say used again. to say that if uh, summer fell on the weekend, they'd have a picnic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. The, uh, uh -huh. Yeah. On the other hand, if well, they're really pale really... and they've got a New Jersey accent, you stake them. <laughs> I never got to the fourth and fifth books, which would explain why so many vampires were coming to Seattle from New Jersey. But there was actually a reason within, <laughs> within the books that so many so many vampires were coming to Seattle from New Jersey. Well, anyway, go ahead. Seattle also off, also has beautiful uh, and sunny summers um, that weekend. <laughs> it's a it's a great town. I love Seattle, um, but it it's got its downsides uh, as well, like vampires or goss. So, um, uh, 
I had something. Oh, I want it. I wanted to talk about. Uh, I don't get too much into the the bad guys in the book, but I really do want to talk about Princess Shalala um, or Shalana. <laughs> Shalana, yeah. Shalala, Shalala. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't. Shalana. She's she's being punished, and she really deserves the punishment. And you know, we don't want to reveal it, but totally, dude. Yeah. But she came up with a totally grody. Yeah, that was like the ultimate deal with the devil right there. I mean, forget, forget about like the actual old ones and stuff that Ray dealt with and that kind of thing, and necromancy and whatnot. He's by far the most evil thing we've had in the series. Yeah, they, that. Uh, <laughs> yeah that, that great old one that they took out with the with the ward stone, nothing compared to yeah, Princess Shalom. Nothing. Nothing, nothing compared nothing. to her. Um... Jeez. There is a fate magic. Yeah, fate magic is pernicious. Um, fate magic is like pernicious and and like totally evil. Um, <laughs> the, oh my God. Fate magic is the worst. <laughs> can you? I mean, can can Larry? Can you sort okay, of to just, explain to people who yeah, are listening to the podcast and have not read the book? Right. The MHI took out a major monster in Seattle. And thereafter, they started dealing with a lot of big monsters moving into the area. And they finally came to the conclusion that monsters have territories and that the big monster that had been in Seattle had been keeping other monsters out. And although what it had been doing was extremely terrible, and I won't get into it because we don't want to give away too much. But it is a, it, um, it's a great fight scene in the book, by the way. Go ahead and say, well, thanks, Larry. Oh. <laughs> uh, Larry, you no, say, well, thanks. I didn't change that much there. I just changed um, a couple technical things. That was it. <laughs> um. <laughs> well, and it's cool the way that they, anyway, there's so much cool stuff. And the way they tracked down the Master Vamp was really cool, too. <laughs> so, anyway, onward with the, uh. The, uh, they, uh. They had a situation where they needed it. they needed something powerful, supernatural, to stabilize the area. And what they finally came, what they they were finally able to find was a fae princess who was trapped in a tower in California. She had been imprisoned in the she she had been uh, punished by her by her mother, who was the queen of the Western Fae to be imprisoned for a hundred years for a violation against the mother and all mothers everywhere. <laughs> so well, they managed to come up with a way to spring her and keep her mother from finding out about it. And then after they do, they find out what the terrible thing was that she did. Um, she had invented Valley speak. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> and it turned out to be like, totally pernicious and like yeah. utterly evil and and really really grody uh, <laughs> and chad came very so, close to trying to collect the puff at that moment when he realized right <laughs> i'll speak fairy princess who like totally can't uh she's totally ve vegetarian except for chicken because she really loves chicken oh and steak oh my god she so loves steak and no i can only drink perrier uh <laughs> Uh. <laughs> so, <laughs> she is, she is, she's like the ultimate evil. <laughs> yeah. Can you? Can you? And so they're debating. They're debating at one point whether they should actually bring her to Seattle, uh, whether they should actually bring her to Seattle, or if they should just go ahead and kill her. Because <laughs> uh. <laughs> the puff on one is huge. But and, yeah, that's that's a major part of the book, so we won't get into a lot more about her. Yeah, it's actually when she orders sushi that that um, Chad considers um, collecting the puff, I guess. He, anyway, <laughs> no, it's when he finds out that she invented the California roll. Uh, she invented. She invented the California roll. This <laughs> pernicious evil, right there, man. Oh well. And tie dye and mood rings. Oh my God! So, uh, Larry, you could, maybe you could explain the role of elves in the series a little bit, so that I mean, this is all part of 
the way elves are in the Monster Hunter universe. No, elves and fae are two different things. Or fae. I'm... Yeah, the, 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 basically the Monster Hunter universe, the, the, the otherworldly forces are divided up into various factions. And mankind really doesn't understand all the boundaries and who all begat who. But elves, elves were created by fae. Um, the fae used to be here in force. Don't know why they left. They have their own uh, dimension, basically. Um, and uh, but so they're not elves. Elves were basically a servitor race to, to them. And so were orcs. And that's why, to this day, elves and orcs really hate each other's guts. But uh, different, different, different races. Uh, Fae are kind of a kind of a collection. They're basically alien um, to us, but uh, all the old world, a lot of the old world fairy tale stuff comes from dealing with the Fae mm. uh, in the Monster Hunter universe. Yeah, uh, and uh, there's some great descriptions uh, that y'all have of of what they really look like behind the glamour as well. You yeah, know, I don't want to give away too much about the book. Yeah. I had gone into the Fae too much, so basically how John described them, uh, because at the end of Nemesis, I teased at the Wild Hunts in the next one, in uh, book six, but uh, I hadn't described them yet. So then John, uh, in this, he wrote more what the Fae looked like and acted like, and so I, I went ahead and revamped what I had for uh, the rest of the Monster Hunter series, because the vision he had of them actually was really creepy and worked great, so that's kind of how uh, that evolved there. Yeah. It was it was very cool. The whole the mythology was was just seamlessly uh, uh, worked in. What are some of the other significant? Um, yeah, I mean, anything else we want to talk about uh, the the monsters and the monster hunting that Chad does um, in Seattle? That maybe some high points. Well, he takes out a werewolf while he's jogging. <laughs> yeah. The one that I've seen people keep bringing up uh, is Microtel. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, like I was reading, I was reading the reviews today, and people are really loving it. But uh, uh, they, I saw repeatedly. Uh, so Microtel is a company based loosely upon a real company uh, that we will not that is say, based, so they don't do it. Based loose, that is based loosely in Redmond, Washington. <laughs> yes. That also uses demons. Has a contract there for their R and D department, yeah. and I, I don't want to say too much. But it's a it's a pretty horrible place to work, and uh, <laughs> they they they're doing a lot of R and D in yeah. various areas. So it doesn't always. Hang work on a second. Well. Let me let me do a little bit of. Um, so there has been a demonic outbreak at the quality control department of Microtel. Okay. Um, and this is uh, this is basically a short reading, um, and remember that this is a, this is a memoir, so it's all first person. So when I say I, it is the character Chad Gardinier who is talking. All right. How many people in the area? I asked. Survivors. Not important. Williamson said. It's just quality control. We sealed the doors and called you. I thought about the reply for a second. Did you used to work for FCB? I asked. Yes, I did. Does it matter? Is this getting the job done? Any particular reason for the breakout? Jesse asked. Might give us a better idea what we're dealing with this time. Deb was using a modified Unix daemon in an experimental GUI, was what he replied phonetically. I speak nine languages and I didn't understand a word. I keep reminding them to use spell check. Apparently they didn't, and the daemon summoning caused a manifestation. Demon, daemon, you get the problem. <laughs> um, wait, I said you use daemons, Greek spirits of translation, in your software? You don't think all this stuff really works on ones and zeros, do you? Brad said. <laughs> Um, that's and the, I mean the the punchline in that is I I, lo, I maybe we shouldn't get but the 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 idea that it didn't really matter because their QA was pretty yeah right um, hang on a second uh, let's see some sort of transdimensional portal opened while he was testing a new piece of software he sank halfway into the floor before it closed horrible way to go. Microtel QC has the highest death rate of any job in the nation, Brad said. Not that you're going to find it in any open reports. Between the supernatural outbreaks, suicides, that one accountant who killed 10 coworkers with a letter opener. Um, there was a secondary door after that one. Uh, 
On the wall of the man trap was a motivational poster of piles of seeds. There was a large pile of what must have been tiny mixed seeds that looked nearly identical and two smaller piles of them separated. The caption read, at Microtel Quality Control, at Microtel, quality control is our number one concern. There was a small window looking into the far room. There was a smeared handprint on the window and spatters of blood. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, when there was a demonic outbreak, what they did was they sealed everybody in from the outside and let the demons eat them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people like that section. Yeah, that's one one way to deal with your bean counters. But Larry, you were a bean counter. How, how do you feel about that? Sure. I wasn't in QA. I didn't care about those guys. Oh, okay. I see. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody cares about QA. Yeah, QA There's a great line. Man. There's a great online site called Tales from the Trenches, which is horror stories about working in software quality control. Mm -hmm. And I'd been reading that just before I started writing the book. And I was like, oh, yeah, I'm going to throw that in. Because, you know, there was going to be the QA section that was constantly dealing with demonic outbreaks or some other supernatural event and being wiped out. And then the next day they just, you know, overnight they clean the whole place out and then just hire up a whole bunch more demon fodder. Um, yeah, they basically throw down sawdust on the floor and call it good. <laughs> <laughs> um, there are occasional little, uh, there are occasional little homages or quips or jokes buried in the books. If you get it, for example, um, Larry, the, when I was reading the first MHI book, what I was waiting for him to do was pick up a, uh, a silver letter opener, the, the opening scene, I was yeah, expecting I the, the silver letter, letter opener. Um, and so, yeah, the, the character that I had in mind who killed all of his coworkers with a letter opener was actually Owen Pitt. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. Yeah, uh, luckily in the timeline he was like five, so yeah, he's good. I know. Yeah. Yeah, I actually thought I actually thought about doing the silver letter opener when I wrote that scene originally, but I was like, you know what? That's too easy. I'm gonna make him. I'm gonna make him fight to the death with his bare hands and then break his neck. Well, I think, I mean, his ultimate weapon was the desk, right, in that scene. But Oh, man, the desk, the desk was awesome. Now, that, yeah. that character is not based upon uh, my accounting boss, just so you know. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I'm not saying it wasn't based on another boss I had earlier in life <laughs> well, uh, when Mr. Huffman dies poorly. But uh, <laughs> we'll neither confirm nor deny. I see. So, well, um, it's great. Great writers steal. One of the, one of the things to throw in here, it's a Hemingway quote. Good writers create, great writers steal. So the thing about it is when you're writing, especially when you're writing characters, you have a tendency to bring in people that you know, people you have met, um, uh, particular characteristics that you see about people, whatever those might be. And that's one of the things that make that makes characters come alive. They become real for people. And this isn't just me. Um, uh, you know, uh, look home for an angel. Um, no, you can't go home again. Was a the the writer was that Faulkner? Uh, Thomas Wolfe. You can't go home again. Was that Faulkner or Williams? Uh, um, Th Thomas Wolfe wrote uh, "Look Home for an Angel" and. Wolf. And said you can't go home again yet. Um, uh, from Asheville. From a small town in North Carolina. It was about a small town in North Carolina. And it was about all of the secrets in a small town in North Carolina. Which was why his next book was called You Can't Go Home Again. Um, yeah, they didn't much like it in Asheville when it came out. <laughs> so. No, they did not. Um, you know, so all writers, all good writers actually all writers draw from people that they've known and draw from in incidents that they they are aware of. Uh, you just have to bring that into whatever universe you're creating. Um, so when Larry says that it might vaguely remind you of, you know, a former boss, 
I've had strong protagonist characters that were based on former bo- good former bosses, and I've had um, I've had villain characters who were based on on bad former bosses. That's just normal. I can't. I killed my editor. Exactly. I wrote that. A bunch of former coworkers were like, "Is that so and so?" And I was like, "Yeah." <laughs> <laughs> oh no, 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 no! Um, one of the characters that was in one of the Post Lane books, who was a uh, a colonel that or a general that really screwed things up, was straight off. They, this, several characters have been straight off written about one of the battalion commanders that I had when I was in. It was just so incredibly bad. On the other hand, in the March of Country books, Armand Ponner was based on the best NCO, best platoon sergeant I ever had. Um, and I already mentioned that I killed my editor. Um, so, you know, it's, it's you, you do that. It's just normal. It's how you have to write. Good writers great, great writers steal. Yeah. So, uh, totally. This is Monster Hunter Memoirs Grunge is the la- as the first, uh, but not the ma- the last of the Monster Hunter Memoirs series. So what's next? How's how is this going to go? Uh, the next one is actually out uh, at the end of the year. Uh, the next one comes out in December. Yeah, and that one's Sinners, correct? Or Sinners. Yeah. By the way, these have great covers by, Wait, by Alan uh, Pollock, I believe. He's he's our artist on these. Yeah, Chad has to uh, uh, Chad has to transfer to someplace other than Seattle because he ticks off somebody fairly powerful who it ticks him off really bad, um, and so he has to he has to go someplace else. And New Orleans has gotten completely out of control. So when he calls and says, "Hey, I need a transfer," they're like, "Well, the the choice is New Orleans or not." Um, and so he goes to New Orleans back to the heat and the humidity and the bugs and everything else. And uh, the second book is, uh, the second, the first book is a lot about Chad, about his background, and it's sort of an intro to the universe. The second book, Sinners, is just explosive uh, in more ways than one. Many, many, many more ways than one. Mm. And ultimately, there's uh, there's three books in the pipeline, right? Yes. Well, there's three books that are going to be part of the series at present. Yeah, the delay on the third one is me because I have to go finish the, like I said, I'm a slow editor. And i got to go finish Monster Hunter 6 out of the regular series first. Uh, and then, uh, then I'll do the edit um, for the third book and should be good to go next year. Yeah, and there's some stuff that uh, Larry and I talked about at Liberty Con. Um, I'm probably going to go back into the third book, and there's some fill-in stuff that needs to go in there. That uh, uh, there was some stuff that I left out of of the second book that was like, "Hey, Larry, do you think you can handle this?" And some of that stuff I'll just go ahead and take care of uh, now that we've discussed the universe a little bit more. Um, yeah, because I've got because uh, people are talking a bit, and I because the uh... Monster Hunter 6 comes out, and I think it's, I think it's August, August 2017. So basically, I've got to the end of the year to get that all nice and pretty for Tony. So yeah, um, do do that, please. I promise. <laughs> we're <yeah. laughs> we're kind of counting on that to anchor the summer there. So I'm working on it. It's pretty. It's actually a pretty awesome book, by the way. So yeah, I, I you guys will. I hope you guys like cool. it. So uh, yeah, what are you you both working on at the moment? That's what I'm working on, Monster Hunter 6. Um, I've actually got the uh, Monster Hunter Anthology coming out next year. That's all done. It's just the one story we're waiting on, um, Jim Butcher's. And then I've got um, uh, – there's a collection of my short stories coming out next year, too, from bands. And then after that, I'm working on the sequel to Son of the Black Sword. It's called House of Assassins. What's it going to be? I've got coming up. Cool. Uh, it's House of Assassins. Oh, cool! It's the book in the Forgotten Warrior yeah, uh, yeah. series. Yeah, cool. I like that title, Larry. Uh, <laughs> anyway, yeah. yeah. What are you working on right now, John? Um, I am doing three things primarily. There is a uh, well, four. I've been taking a look at the third book and doing some tweaks uh, having to do with. Uh, 
sort of trying to read Larry's minds on the basis of the edits on grunge of taking some of the stuff out that would that that he find and, and want to edit change whatever um and and there's also some stuff that that was fill in that i i'm filling in so that uh the second thing that i'm working on is in the black tide rising universe there were a lot of questions about characters that had been left behind and their storylines had had been lost, essentially dangling storylines. A guy named Mike Massa, who was one of the contributors to the Black Tide Rising anthology, and again, good grudge, great, great writer Steele, he was the basis for Tom Smith, who was one of the characters in Under Graveyard Sky, Um, and turns out is a fantastic author. I, I I have repeatedly said that, you know, I had I asked Mike if he would write the Battle of the Birds and, and wasn't too sure what I was going to get and figured that I was going to have to do a lot of work on it and it got turned in and it was a fantastic story. And I was like, holy, holy cow, uh, Mike can actually write. So I asked him if he would just go ahead and write the Tom Smith story. And so we are collaborating on the 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 story of what happened to Tom Smith in the Black Tide Rising universe. Um, I'm working on that. Uh, at the same time, I am essentially normally I write in huge bursts, but in this case, I'm sort of slogging along through the next Troy book, which is uh, technically that universe is the Spiral Arm War. Um, and it is uh, – the problem for it is that it is a rearmament period. It is a period of relative peace between the humans and the various groups that they have been fighting. So it it may not involve any combat at all. Uh, I joke that it might be the first John Rigo novel where nobody dies. Um, what? <laughs> Well, if you read the Lois Bujold books, you you have all of the Miles for Cosigan and the Dendari stories, and then you have um, a civil campaign, which is all about what's going on at home. And it may it so far it's very similar to that. It's showing how humanity is starting to, to adopt all of the galactic technologies and how they're affecting the world. Um, and uh, this the fourth thing that I'm working on is a collaboration with two more writers from the Black Tide Rising universe, but it is a new universe. It was originally designed for Larry to write in, um, and so we're we're writing in that universe. It's a, Larry, it's the, the, the Gantz universe with the... With oh, yeah, the, I was, uh, talking, to, I was talking to Casey. Oh, can we, can we say their names? Yeah, Casey Smith, uh, Casey Azell and okay. Chris Smith. Yeah, so I'm yeah. talking to Casey and Chris about it, and that is fantastic because both of those guys are super cool. So very talented, up and coming writers, uh, and Mike Massa too. Mike, I have not read his stuff yet, but Mike's just a super nice guy. So the yeah, Casey yeah. and Chris were just they you were just Mike giving well. liberty con. Yeah, we had um, Mike and Casey on the podcast. I uh, don't know Mike very well. Um, <laughs> maybe, uh, <laughs> Well, he's nice to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Mike Massa is, uh, and this is part of his open biography. He's uh, uh, combat. He was a SEAL with combat experience in Mogadishu and some other places that he can't talk about um, uh, during that time frame. Uh, and later, he was the commander of Butts. Or not of Buds. Uh, he was commander of the Hell Week portion of Buds, uh, and then at a certain point got out of the Navy, became a defense contractor, and has done various security, high-end technological-based security stuff since then. Um, yeah, like I said, nice to me. Probably not nice to you know various people in Mogadishu and whatnot, but uh, he is. He I is like the kind of guy that is the nicest guy in the world. Um, it has a, right has up a to the moment that he has to kill everyone you. in the room. <laughs> <laughs> you might not want him as your CrossFit instructor. If <laughs> uh, 
No. That would require me. No, to God no. That's not going to happen. He was, yeah. And then, and then, and then, and then. What what is it that your wife said about you, Larry? That your idea of exercise is sitting on a on a exercise bike playing Call of Duty. Oh no, man! I play World of Tanks on the exercise bike like uh, a boss. I see. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, when my tank accelerates, I pedal faster. It's just psychological. Yeah. <laughs> I th- by the way, I would like to to remind everyone we have a great um, a great podcast that featured. Um, both uh, Larry and John's wives talking about their work habits and, and lives and such. So check that out. We want to do another one of those soon if we can. Yeah, I guess yeah, that was the most popular uh, podcast you guys have ever done. It was pretty popular. Yeah, it's uh, uh, Miriam. <laughs> Miriam comments very, uh, very humorously on the stuff. Um, the thing about it is, is that all of the wives look uh, – Sharon Weber is essentially David Weber's wife is essentially the grand dame of the writer's wife. She's the one who gets everybody together and tells them how to survive being married to an author. Because mm. it ain't easy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Sharon is awesome. Yeah, we had uh, uh we had our token male uh, Dan Hoyt and um who else we have uh Miriam and uh, Dan Wait and uh, Lou. Uh, right, Lou. Eric Flint's wife. Yeah, but the thing about it is, is that Lou doesn't show up as much because she's got she's got a day job. Um, but uh, at one point, Miriam was talking about that uh, she was telling another wife that when when we have something like the Bain dinners or where of the dinner where all the authors and their wives get together, oh yeah, we sit at the other end of the table so we can actually have a conversation. Uh, <laughs> and I'm like, yep, yeah, okay. Bye, honey. Bye. Yeah. Bye-bye. <laughs> Writers do tend to uh, have a lot to say in many circumstances. So. Uh, well, um, it's a it's a great series, um, Monster Hunter Memoirs. Uh, it's a great addition to the series, and it's a great thing you could just read uh, as a standalone, too. It's It's a lot of fun. The book is Monster Hunter Memoirs Grunge by Larry Correa and John Ringo. It's now at booksellers everywhere. Uh, Larry and John, thank you so much for being with us. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks, Tony. Now we continue with our complete audiobook serialization of David Drake's The Sea Without a Shore. It seems Cinnabar's chief spymaster is a mother also, and her son is determined to search for treasure in the midst of a civil war. Who better to hold the boy's hand and to take the blows directed at him than Captain Daniel Leary, the Republic of Cinnabar Navy's troubleshooter, and his friend the cyberspy Adele Mundy? The only thing certain in the struggle for control of the mining planet Corsera is that the Rival parties are more dangerous to their own allies than to their opponents. Daniel and Adele face kidnappers, pirates, and a death squad, even before they can get to the real business of ending the war on Coursera and bringing their charge home, maybe along with ancient alien treasure. Now here is the next entry of David Drake's The Sea Without a Shore. The Upper Cephasis River Valley is a mining region, said Cleveland. He didn't appear to be put out by Daniel pressing him. At the time Pantelleria and its colonies joined the alliance, he paused and smiled. Daniel smiled back. The Transformationist Assembly, which is legally a corporation, refiled its land claim under alliance law. This was simply a precaution. And a very wise one, thought Daniel. The transformationists might be religious loonies, but they were neither stupid nor politically naive. Among the information deposited along with the claim was a certified assay of Pearl Valley, showing that neither copper nor any other ore is present in significant amounts. This isn't required for a claim, of course, but I presume it was done to turn away Alliance bureaucrats who might assume that we, that the assembly of the day, was sitting on vast mineral wealth. That sort of thing has been known to happen, Daniel said, and not only when the new overlords came from Plaisance. 
gritty administrators were a reality of imperial rule, and the Republic of Cinnabar was as surely an empire as the Alliance was. I looked at the file, Cleveland said, as well as the assays. It contained a microwave scan of the subsurface rocks. While I was still on Cinnabar, I'd been employed by an engineering firm owned by a friend of my mother. He smiled ruefully. Not employed very long, of course, he said. But I picked up some rudiments. There was an object thirty feet down in the rock, small, no larger than a man's head, but of a very irregular shape. The scan proceeded down the full length of the valley, which allowed the computer to create three-dimensional models. The software couldn't model this, however. Adele didn't look up, but her wands had paused. Knowing her habits, Daniel suspected she had a real-time image of Cleveland's face inset on her holographic display, just as she did while talking with others on the bridge of a starship. All right, said Daniel. You found an anomaly in the ground. Why do you believe it's a treasure? Cleveland nodded, smiling again. He'd gained his first point. Do you know anything about the settlement of Corsera? He asked. I know a little, Daniel said. And by now, Adele probably knew quite a lot, but he didn't say that aloud. It was settled from Pantelleria about 500 years ago, initially as a farming colony. The copper deposits were discovered shortly thereafter. Corsera became a major mining center as it remains today. That's the official story, Cleveland said, nodding. It's the true story, Daniel said, frowning. The records of the discovery, the minutes of the Council of Pantelleria approving the colony, the names of all 3,700 colonists in the initial migration, they all exist. I've seen them, and I believe my colleague can show them to you right now if you're in doubt. I could, said Adele without looking up. But I suspect Master Cleveland is referring to the legend that there was a pre-hiatus settlement on Corsera before the Pantellarians arrived. Yes, Lady Mundy. Cleveland said, turning his eyes toward Adele for the first time. Though not pre-hiatus. I don't know of any evidence supporting that belief. But I believe I've found evidence that Corsera was settled from Bay about 800 years ago, long before Pantelleria discovered the planet and sent its colony. Adele's wands danced like the surface of a pond in a rainstorm, she said. Bay settled Ischia and the Ribbon Stars 800 years ago. That was the only colony ship which Bay sent out. Before the end of the century, Bay had collapsed into civil war from which its civilization never recovered. The factions were using fusion bombs, and they stopped fighting simply because the infrastructure could no longer support weapons more advanced than spear throwers. The colony ship from Bay, the Colsac 5747, was under Captain Pearl, Cleveland said. That's correct, isn't it? Yes, Adele said. The only further data I have on the venture is that there were some 13,000 settlers. Cleveland, said Daniel. He hoped he kept the sudden concern out of his voice. Did you get this idea of a treasure because the captain's name is the same as that of the valley your church is set up in? If the boy had done something so silly, the whole business was absurd, and he was probably too deluded to listen to reason. Much as Daniel would like to help the Sands. No, Captain Leary. Cleveland said with a smile of calm amusement. He was, after all, Daniel Sr. by a year or two. The coincidence of names caused me to look into Ischian history, however. There was a surprising amount of information available on Corsera, since the planets are neighbors and Ischia was a major trading partner of Corsera and of Pantelleria as well. You have the advantage of me there, Daniel said. He felt embarrassed, even though he hadn't actually said anything insulting about Cleveland's intelligence or common sense. I know nothing of the other stars in the ribbon cluster save Pantelleria. Captain Pearl landed on Ischia as planned and disembarked the colonists, Cleveland said. He and the crew were to be colonists also, in the normal fashion of colony ships. Ordinarily, the ship, the Colsac 5747, would have been cannibalized for the colony's use, but there were two factions within the colonists. Not long after landing on Ischia, Captain Pearl lifted off again with most of the crew and about a thousand of the original colonists. The Colsac 5747 was never heard of again. Bloody hell, said Daniel. He shook his head, feeling a little queasy at the implications of what Cleveland had said. 
I'm not surprised the ship disappeared. It may not have made it into orbit after liftoff. Colony ships are huge, and they're not built for repeated liftoffs and landings. Was the division among the colonists due to the religious arguments which led to the civil war that broke out on Bay a generation later? Adele said. For politeness's sake, she looked at Cleveland this time as she spoke. I don't know, Lady Mundy, Cleveland said. My source here is an Ischian history, which I suspect was intended as a school text. What it says is that Captain Pearl and his confederates stole a great treasure. Could that not have been the ship itself? Adele said. The cargo had largely been landed when Pearl lifted off again, but the loss of the ship must have been a great handicap to the new colony. The coal sack may have been the treasure, certainly, Cleveland agreed. Nothing else appearing, I might assume that it was. But there's the buried anomaly in the Pearl Valley. The fact that the ship lifted from Ischia doesn't prove that it landed on Corsera, Daniel said, but his tone was mild. He was becoming intrigued, more or less despite himself. As I say, it may well have broken up on Ischia. Not in sight of the ground, Cleveland said. I'm sure from the tone of the history that it would have been recorded as just retribution of providence on the traitors. Daniel nodded in understanding. Adele raised her eyes again and said, I would like to see this history, if I may. The original is waiting at the door with Gilfin, Cleveland said. He was gaining assurance as the interview went on. Your reputation preceded you, Lady Mundy. I made a copy, but you may be able to learn things from the original which have escaped me. It struck Daniel that the boy must have inherited his mother's intelligence as well as her strong jaw and broad forehead. His willowy height, however, owed nothing to Mistress Sand's short, blocky frame. What decided me to return to Cinnabar and attempt to mount an expedition, Cleveland said, was the port computer at the Capital Brotherhood. It's the main starport where the river broadens and forms a pool at the base of the foothills. Yes, said Daniel, nodding cautiously. The computer comes from a starship, Cleveland said. I know, that's common. A computer which can calculate navigation in the matrix has more capacity than any use in normal space requires. Yes, said Daniel, no matter how old it is. This computer, it's in the manor, Brotherhood's government building, Cleveland went on. This computer was manufactured on Bay. And nothing so sophisticated has been manufactured on Bay for the past 700 years. Adele's wands were in quivering motion. I want to see the computer, she said to her display. Will that be possible? I don't think it would be difficult if you were in Brotherhood, Cleveland said. It certainly wasn't for me. He cleared his throat and added, sounding diffident again. May I ask a question, please? Does your question mean that you're thinking of investing in the expedition? You've convinced me to provide the ship and crew for the expedition at my own expense, Daniel said. He assumed that was what Adele intended, but it didn't matter. She had made him lead, so she would back him, whatever her personal opinion. I'll talk to Mistress Sand. I expect that she can outfit the vessel from her own resources, so there's no need of outside investors. We'll need a cargo, you see, and she's well-placed to provide it. He smiled at Cleveland and rose to his feet. You found the, well, the treasure, we'll call it for now. For that, you'll keep a third. Your mother will get a third, and I will get the remaining third. Can we shake on a partnership on those terms? He offered his hand. Cleveland stood, looking stunned. Captain Leary, he said, this is very fair, more than fair but I've already discussed arrangements with Captain Sorley of the freighter Madison Merchant. He has been willing to carry me if I indemnified him against loss in a war zone. That's why I asked Mother for financial help. I don't know Captain Sorley, Daniel said, his mind racing through possibilities. Have you signed a contract yet? Based on his record, Adele said, still seated and scrolling through data. Captain Sorley has never kept a contract in his life, of course, I have only a few of his aliases. It could be that under other names he's more honest. What? said Cleveland. He slowly extended his arm, though he continued to stare at Adele. Daniel grasped his hand and shook it firmly. There, partner, he said. I'll keep you informed of developments. I don't think it will be long before we can lift from here and get to work. 
Adele rose to her feet and slipped her data unit into its pocket. Yes, she said. And Master Cleveland, I strongly advise you not to discuss the matter further with Captain Sorley. He is a liar and a thief and very probably a murderer. You would soil yourself by spitting in his face. Do I make myself clear? Ah, Cleveland said. Lady Mundy, we transformationists attempt to find good in every human being. Adele stepped briskly toward the door. I told you that Sorley was probably a murderer, she said over her shoulder. That benefit of the doubt was all the good I could find regarding the man. Daniel, still smiling, nodded to Cleveland. He followed Adele out. That was another entry in our complete audiobook serialization of The Sea Without a Shore by David Drake. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com, to Christopher Rocchio, and to podcast theme composer Ruth Jodkowitz. And a full-blown broadside from the canons of determination and good humor and excellent shot clusters against that ship of the line captained by evil and his pirate buddies Envy and Gluttony, plus a toromachia of prize bulls bellowing thanks and praise to Larry Correa and John Ringo, authors of Monster Hunter Memoirs Grunge. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy, and keep reaching for the stars. 